Well, brethren, we come in this hour to the last of the lectures dealing with what some would call homiletics proper, though God willing, I will have two lectures tomorrow that in a very real sense undergird and percolate through everything we've considered. But let's ask the Lord's help that he will crown this time with his special presence and blessing. Let's seek God's face together. Father, we are thankful for the way you have helped us in these many hours we have been privileged to spend together seeking to think and wrestle with matters relative to how best we may fulfill the biblical mandate to preach the word. And now we ask your help as we consider together these final thoughts of the conclusions of our sermons that we may learn how better to bring our sermons home into the theater of the consciences, the affections, and the wills of our hearers. Help us then to this end we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now we've considered together what I call the goals of the conclusion, and there were three of them, and then the various means to attain those goals. And now we cover in the third place some practical directives concerning the construction of the conclusion of our sermons. And perhaps the best way to set out these directives is to organize them under two headings, the do's and the don'ts in constructing the conclusions of our sermons. So we start with the positive directives, the things we ought consciously to seek to do when working on the conclusion of our sermons. And the first is construct a conclusion that truly concludes the sermon. A conclusion should be what we call it and should bring the sermon to a sense that, yes, we have had this element of divine truth laid before us, its implications and its pressure upon our emotions and will set before us, and as Dabney suggests, then we must shut up our hearers to God and trust that that truth will effectually work in them, whether unto conversion or unto their further maturation as the people of God. So aim to construct a conclusion that truly concludes. Ask yourself, if I were sitting in the congregation listening to what I am preparing to say, would I feel that it had come to a real conclusion? And as you do so, my second word of positive directive is labor under the restraint of what I have called over the years the discipline of exclusion. The discipline of exclusion. Since all of God's truth is interrelated, the more you grow in your understanding of God's truth, you will see many and additional corollaries and inferences from the truth you've established in any given sermon. And you must be careful not to destroy the unity of discourse with extraneous matters, squeezing them into the conclusion when in reality there was nothing substantive in the sermon itself to suggest that application. The suggestion came from following the truth to some of its capillaries, but you've moved away from the main arterial parts of that truth. And just like our circulation system, we've got our, our main arteries and you've got your aorta, but then it goes down into capillaries. It's all part of one circulatory system. And we must not set out the whole system when we're taking one of the parts. So we must learn the discipline of excuse, exclusion. There may be 10 different things that are suggested to our minds when focusing upon a given truth, but it's really not a necessary deduction, a necessary uh, corollary of the truth that we have preached. We do well to listen to the advice of Shedd concerning this very issue. He writes, let unity run clear through the sermon 
and clear out. If there be other lessons to be taught from the text, teach them in other sermons. If there be other applications of truth, make them in other discourses. It is not as if the preacher had no other opportunity, as if he must say everything in one sermon and apply everything in a single discourse. He has the year and the years before him in which to make full proof of his ministry, in which to exhibit the truth upon all sides and apply it to all classes of men. Let him therefore make each sermon a round and simple unit and trust to the whole series of his sermons to impart a full and comprehensive knowledge of the Christian system and to make a complete application of it to all grades and all varieties of character. Uh, for example, if you were expounding the first chapter of Ephesians, that marvelous eulogy of the apostle, it would be very easy as you track the thought of the apostle, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he chose us in him, etc., etc., to get caught up in the thought of, do I eulogize? Do I know what it is to go before God and just bless him for who he is and what he's done and then find yourself in your application breaking off into a sort of a mini exhortation, a topical sermon on the desirability and necessity of being a eulogizer in our prayers. You see, that would be a very natural thing suggested to your mind, but it's really not the thrust of that passage. So that's the kind of thing Shed is addressing that I'm addressing. Thirdly, the third do of constructing a conclusion is choose a method of conclusion which assumes a state of heightened emotion and passion both in you as the preacher and in your hearers. We can never tell what will actually occur in the activity of preaching with respect to this matter of heightened emotion in ourselves and in our hearings. However, we should be praying and preparing with the anticipation that the friction of the truth we're preaching upon our own minds, upon our own spirits, and the friction of that truth upon the minds and hearts of our people will bring us both to a state of heightened emotion at the conclusion of the sermon. Though we cannot predict what exactly will happen, and I hope to establish in the next unit, that the sermon prepared lying in its notes on the desk and the sermon preached and delivered are two different things. The act of preaching is a completely different thing from the act of preparation. And we never know what God may do in the act of preaching. I liken preparation to conception and gestation in the womb of a woman. Preaching is the birthing process. And sometimes what was conceived and gestates is still born. Sometimes it's born kicking and screaming and full of activity, and there are elements that we cannot predict. However, even with that qualification, I believe it is right for us to expect that the truth we've delivered has warmed our own affections, has heightened our own passions, as well as our people. And the older writers again recognize this. Listen to Dabney as he speaks to it. All writers on eloquence, ancient and modern, seem to have concurred in the opinion that the peroration, the conclusion, should excel in persuasion. You will be hereafter more distinctly instructed in the nature and means of this part of rhetoric, but you doubtless already comprehend that we mean by persuasion, as distinguished from argument, those appeals which are aimed directly at the heart. In the conclusion, if anywhere, the religious affection should be touched. The power of moral painting must now be involved. 
the preacher's soul should here show itself fired with the force of the truth which has been developed and glowing both with light and heat. The quality of unction should suffuse the end of your discourse and bathe the truth in evangelical emotion. And then he goes on to say, it's not faked, it's not forced, it is the result of the Spirit of God upon our spirits in conjunction with the truth as they work their way out into our emotions. And then he goes on in the next page to just expand in a very perceptive and compelling way on this principle. And then the quote you have from Broadus does a similar thing. So it is right for us sitting at the desk when we may have what I would call about 100 BTUs, British thermal units of heat, from the truth we've been meditating upon to expect that in the act of preaching that same truth, not another, that same truth under the influence of the Holy Spirit as we are speaking it, that the BTUs will go up at least to 500 or maybe 1,000. Not some other truth, that very truth. But as we feel the friction of it upon our minds, our spirits, we see in the faces of our people that they are being kindled by that truth. We together are lifted to a heightened state of emotion and our conclusion, assuming that, should be constructed accordingly. Now, these men who wrote, they were not wild-eyed charismatics. These men were strict, historical, evangelical, experimental Calvinists. But they understood this dimension of the work of the Spirit in the act of preaching and unashamedly articulated it in their writings on the subject of preaching. Well, there's the do's. Now, I have some don'ts. The don't directives, the negative directives regarding the conclusion. And the first is probably the most important. Don't skimp on the labor connected with a well-prepared conclusion. To have an ill-prepared conclusion preceded by a sloppy introduction, a good discussion or argument in the sermon, and then a rotten conclusion, that would be like having a sandwich given to you by your host that had good, fresh, sliced deli meat in the middle, but a stale hunk of bread on the top and a stale hunk of bread on the bottom. You don't want a sandwich like that. You want good, fresh bread on the top and the bottom and good, fresh deli meat in the middle. Well, you see, if the conclusion is flat and flavorless, that's an analogy that I hope will stick in your mind. We must not skimp on the labor to give to our people well-prepared conclusions. And here again, listen to Broadus. The conclusion will, for the most part, consist of application. This term, as we've already seen, is popularly used to embrace a variety of materials, including application proper, suggestions for practical guidance, and persuasive appeal. He goes on then to say it is quite wrong to suppose, as some preachers appear to do, that every sermon must end with a very pathetic or overwhelming appeal. It is not unfrequently best to end quietly, yet still so as to impress. And whatever the subject might require, let a man not speak in an emotional manner unless he really feels it. And he goes on to say this idea of working up some kind of, of feigned emotion, disgust, discerning people, we must not do it, but it does not undermine the necessity of carefully laboring to construct our conclusions. In giving this exhortation not to skimp on your labors in connection with your conclusions, I'm in no way denying the fact that as your people warm to your subject in the act of preaching, your conclusions may be greatly expanded in content and in spiritual intensity while on your feet. 
Any man worth his weight as a preacher knows what it is to have light and insight to come in ways far beyond what you expected, far beyond what's in your notes. And we're not denying that. But nonetheless, if we come adequately prepared, let the Holy Spirit take us far beyond our preparation, but let's not expect the Holy Spirit to make up for our laziness in lack of preparation for our conclusion. Those are two entirely different things. Well, the Lord really came and enlarged my heart in my conclusion last week, so I'll just trust the Holy Ghost to do it this week, and I'll give no attention to my conclusion. That's presumption. That's not trust. That doesn't honor the Holy Spirit. So my first negative directive is don't skimp on the labor connected with the well-prepared conclusion. I quote from Dabney, and he speaks very clearly to this matter. I would urge that the conclusion always be the subject of careful preparation. It is no less important that our last impression be a good one than our first. The practical sense which the hearer entertains of the effect and force of the sermon is that which is left upon his soul at its termination. Then he quotes Vinay on homiletics, one of the old classic works. I'm thankful I have a used copy of that in my library, one of the old masters that men like Dabney and Shedd obviously consulted. This comes from Vinay. He is the conqueror who remains master of the battlefield, end quote. Nothing can be more faulty than to leave the conclusion to the accidental suggestions of the moment. The speaker is then exhausted. He's expended his store of thoughts. He feels that while he's not willing to sit down, he virtually has nothing more to say. He beats the air with empty declamation. He wears away the impression of the truths already unfolded by their bald repetition. He endeavors to cover his retreat by noise. I'm sure all of us can think of times when, to our shame, we have done that, rather than simply say to our people, listen folks, there's only so many hours in the day. I got my exegesis done, my homiletics and structure of the body of the sermon. I simply didn't have time to construct a fitting conclusion. Let's pray and ask God to bless his truth. At least the people will admire you for your honesty, then pity you when they see you just waffling about trying to say something to have a conclusion. You see, if you have a true people of God, they never despise your honesty. Let the clay show. I can remember one time uh, Tozer, he was preaching a sermon and he took us all up into the heights. And then all of a sudden he said, well, no one ever taught me how to conclude a sermon and we're done. Let's pray. But in some ways, it was a striking conclusion. It left the truth that had lifted you up, it left you right there. Now, another time, he was a master. He was a master. He had been preaching a sermon on total commitment to Christ. And he based his sermon, it was biblical, but he based his sermon on the words of an old mystic who prayed, Lord, give me three wounds the wound of conviction, the wound of contrition, and the wound of yearning after Christ. And he preached his sermon on those three heads. I still remember it. I haven't heard it in years, but there it stuck. And when he got to his final point, the wound of a yearning after Christ, he gave this illustration. He said, when I labored in western Pennsylvania out in mining country, he said there was a young man in the church there where a man was present for special evangelistic meetings and they were praying that God would save sinners in the community. And this young man who worked in the mines, he took a day off from his work, lost his pay to spend the day in prayer and in fasting. The next morning, they had their meeting on the sun, Monday night, the next morning he went into the mine and while he was in the mine, the tipple, the little car that ran on the tracks, jumped the tracks broken pieces, and a large splinter entered his femoral artery. And Tozer went on to say, that young man lay there 
in the mind, and he bled to death. He said, what a way to die, to lie all Monday before God with the open wound of a yearning after God, and the next day to wake up in the presence of Jesus. That's Christianity. This let's go play, that's heresy. And he sat down. I get the goosebumps just repeating it. That's a conclusion that concluded and drove home the whole point of the sermon. So he did not skimp. He obviously thought that thing through very, very carefully. And though it was short, it did what the conclusion should do. So don't skimp on the labor connected with a well-prepared conclusion. Secondly, don't be too long in your conclusions. The warning regarding excessive length in detail in a resume or recapitulation has already been given. And under this heading, I'm thinking of the length as it relates particularly to pressing issues on the consciences and wills of our people, what we would call the very heightened emotional dimension of our conclusions. And all of the old writers, you have quotes from Shedd, from Dabney, and from Broadus, they all issue a word of caution, and for this reason, they write, and this is the quote from Shedd, but such a species of discourse, that is, the conclusion that has the heightened emotional pressure, cannot continue long, and perhaps the art of the preacher is nowhere more visible than in the skill with which, in the conclusion, he presses his theme upon the affections and will of the hearers. If this vehemence is too prolonged, it defeats itself. If this exhortation goes beyond the proper limits, it not only fatigues, but disgusts the mind of the listener. Think of your own experience. When someone has been preaching and he comes to a very condensed hortatory section and he's pressing it, and then he keeps pressing and keeps pressing, there's a point at which you want to say, brother, I got the message back off. Don't trample on me. You ever feel trampled upon with excessive vehemence? They recognize that and they said, don't trample on your people. Don't do that. Don't let your conclusion be too long, especially the aspects that put pressure upon the emotions and the wills of your people. And then I quote this just from Dabney. I'll leave you to read Shed on your own. When once the truth is found full access to the hearer's soul, the best possible thing to be done is to leave it there to perform its own work. Protracting the discourse beyond this point only undoes what has been already affected. One object of the conclusion is to awaken emotion. Now listen to the similarity of language. Remember that vehement affections are never long sustained. When the conviction has once invested itself with strong feeling in the soul of the listener, that is the propitious moment to dismiss him to his own meditations. If he is then detained, his emotion will speedily subside, and with it, the impression you have made. The most important thing, therefore, is that you know when to stop, and be sure to stop when you have done. Very wise words, and especially for some of us, God has put us together in such a way that when the Spirit of God assists us in our preaching, we are intense and passionate. And they're not ashamed to use the word vehement. Now, some men, some men, God has so put them together and the Spirit so works in them and upon them, they are never vehement. And yet they obviously have the unction of the Spirit of God. So I'm not speaking just to those of us who are more temperamentally passionate 
and more volatile when our minds and hearts are inflamed with truth. But we have a particular danger at this point that we do not ride herd over our people and pummel them emotionally simply because we are being carried along in this tide of emotion. For remember, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And the Holy Spirit is never more in control than when you are most in control. And when you sense enough is enough, even though you have to shut down all your systems, you shut them down because the great end of all preaching is what? Let all things be done unto edification. Building up, not tearing down by an excessive emotional pummeling. Then my third negative counsel is this. Don't be bound by one method or pattern of conclusion. While always keeping the goals before you, remember there's more than one way to reach those goals. All of the goals and purposes for the conclusion need not be equally distributed through each sermon that you preach. The advice of Broadus in this matter is profoundly insightful and very helpful. Listen to him. The length of the conclusion, like that of the introduction, is dependent on circumstances and no rule can be laid down. But there is great danger of making it too long, especially in hortatory appeals, that is, exhortations to our people. The feeling of the speaker inclines him to continue... But the feelings of the hearers cannot be kept long at a high point. All three of these men, none of them quoting the other, recognized that principle. If the sermon has been long, the conclusion should certainly be brief, save in peculiar cases. Sometimes the close of the last division really brings the whole train of thought to an end and gives it a practical turn. Any separate conclusion is then unnecessary and commonly undesirable. Sometimes an abrupt conclusion is very effective when well managed with good taste and unaffected solemnity. Tozer, the incident I shared with you, very brief. But those words, I can still hear him saying them. This let's go play business, that's heresy. Stuck you, riveted you right to your pew with the thrust of the sermon. Sometimes the preacher will be overcome by emotion and then tearful silence will be more powerful than speech. And then he goes on and has, again, more very helpful words to say. Most of all, it is unwise to give indication that one is about to conclude and then start again and keep dragging on. Now, Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, can say finally when he's only halfway through an epistle. You ain't Paul and you ain't writing epistles under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And don't bear false witness not about your neighbor, but to your neighbor. Now, brethren, as we conclude, then conclude. Don't keep them sitting there for another 15 minutes. You say, finally, let it be finally. You're not Paul, all right? That wasn't in my notes, but I thought it should be said. All right. So, how are we going to do that? If we're not going to be bound by one method or one pattern of conclusion... Let me give you some practical suggestions in connection with this word of counsel. Consider the following suggestions. Vary the placement of the elements of your conclusion. Vary the focal point of your application when it's there in your conclusion. Again, Shedd speaks to that issue. You have the quote there, pages 180 and 181. And then get comfortable with a varied emotional climate and pattern in your conclusions. Don't feel that all of your sermons must conclude with a conclusion wrapped in the wind and fire and attended by thunder. The prophet heard God in the stillness. Then came a still voice and he hears the Lord speaking to him, the still voice small voice. 
And so, like all of these other aspects, we've got to cultivate the art of constructing conclusions that to our people are not predictable and same. Just think what it's like when they're sitting under some, some of us, our people sat under us for decades. And what would it be like to have the same menu week in, week out from your wife? You could always count Thursday night was going to be spaghetti and meatballs. Spaghetti and meatballs in the hospital, out of the hospital, spaghetti and meatballs. Thursday night, spaghetti and meatballs. Well, our people are human beings, and God's made us as human beings that variety keeps up interest. And so our people should not be able to say, okay, here we are. It's 40 minutes into the sermon. He's going to start his conclusion. This is the way it'll be concluded. And they could almost say, preacher, sit down. Let me take over for you. That shouldn't be. We should seek to have variety as the material we're preaching lends itself to that variety. Now I have a final exhortation, and that's what it is, a final exhortation. It's not a do, it's not a don't, but it's an exhortation to grasp a fundamental principle of preaching. And the principle is this. Perhaps in no division of the sermon is the true spiritual state of the preacher's soul more patent than in preaching his conclusion. Follow me now. A measure of literary cleverness may stand a man of God in good stead with respect to his introductions. Competent intellectual tools and a good library may greatly assist him in presenting an acceptable discussion or argument in his sermon. However, it is in the elements folded into the conclusion that the true state of his own soul is often most clearly laid bare. It's in the preaching of the conclusion of our sermons that our knowledge of the struggles of the true child of God, the joys, the disappointments in the ebb and flow of the Christian life, and our ability to get inside our hearers, it is in the conclusion that most often those issues are revealed in the most patent way. If our vision is dull as preachers, it will show here. If our heart is cold and indifferent to the need of sinners and to the struggles of the believer, if that is true, cold to God and cold to our people, it will show in our conclusions. If our determination to be understood and heard is weak, it will often be seen in our conclusions, in our pathetic efforts to try to rivet the truth to the minds of our people and to get them to see the, d- the demands of that truth upon their wills. And so I urge you, brethren, to constantly examine yourself in terms of what do my conclusions reveal about the true state of my heart. I was talking with one of the brethren earlier today and saying that when we've opened up a passage that had no real natural avenue to address the unconverted, are we simply to be silent as though everyone sitting before us were a child of God? And we were agreed on the fact that no, it's in times like that that if we really yearn for the salvation of people and yet the passage we're expounding had little or nothing of any logical direct reference, we'd stop and say, now, there may be some of you sitting here this morning and everything you've heard has been as though I were speaking in Korean or Chinese. It's gone right over your head. And you know why it's done that? It's because you're blind spiritually blind. And the Bible says, you are a natural man. You do not understand the things of the Spirit of God, neither can you know them. But oh, my friend, listen to me. Listen to me. There is a living Christ able to give you spiritual sight. He's able to give you spiritual life. So the things you've heard this morning will become meat and drink to your soul. You'll sit here with these other people drooling with delight when you hear things of a similar nature. Let me plead with you. Go to Christ to have life 
and sight and understanding in the things of God. That little two-minute homily to the unconverted had no direct reference to the text whatsoever. Why create an artificial one? But if your heart beats for sinners, how can you close having no word to sinners? Can't do it. So you'll find a way to do it in your conclusion in making that entreaty even to the lost. I close with Gardner Spring's statement about this matter as it relates to the whole issue of earnestness and felt reality as we preach. He says, the highest intensity of feeling ever brought to the truth of God falls below the great and exciting theme. Whatever is lucid in statement, vivid or great in conception, powerful in argument, accurate in discrimination in a word, all that is concentrated or discursive which the preacher himself is able to command may be employed and exhausted on the great and varied subjects with which his mind is officially familiar. And then he goes on to say that even though we have this vessel in earth, this treasure in earth in vessels, we must be prepared to have the truth take us and wring us out to our people and by the grace of God be able to have a good conscience that we've not been talking Bible heads, but we've been men of God earnestly entreating, excuse me, pleading, exhorting, admonishing that we might present every man perfect or mature in Christ. Well, brethren, that brings us to a close of our 11 lectures on uh, the second unit of our consideration of the man of God in the pastoral office exercising his preaching with respect to its form and to its substance. And God willing, in the next unit, we'll take up something that is a great delight to my soul, the man of God in the act of preaching. This has been the most, uh, from the human standpoint, the most technical part of the entire a series of lectures, but you men have made it a delight for me to rework it and to uh, present it. And for the most part, uh, you've gotten through it without getting too glassy-eyed, and I thank you for your attention. Well, let's pray, and then, God willing, as I said, tomorrow, the last two lectures, I'll be addressing a theme that should cast its shadow backwards over everything that we've considered together. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have had thus far to be together and to open our hearts and minds one to another. And we pray again that in all of these matters you will help us, that we will not be overwhelmed with the magnitude of our task, but that by your grace we will apply ourselves with renewed diligence to become the best preachers that prayer and pains and conscious labor will make us. So we commit ourselves in all of these matters into your hands for your blessing through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.